Good evening, everybody. I declare the meeting open at four minutes past six. I'd like to start by acknowledging that tonight we meet on the lands of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, we do have uh, an apology for this evening um, from Councillor Joanne Fatakis and I've also been notified by Councillor um, Murphy and Councillor Loden that they are running late this evening um, and I do also expect um, to hear soon from Councillor Harley but we have a quorum so we'll commence the meeting. Um, what we will first do is go to question time and receiving of public statements. So welcome members of the public gallery. This is your opportunity to come to the microphone and speak to an item on tonight's agenda. We do ask that you state your name, your address and the item. Uh, thank you, Mayor Cole. We have a number of them. I'll start with the one that's printed in the agenda papers. That's right. Um, and that is from me, Link Service CEO. I've disclosed a direct financial interest in confidential item 12.1. The nature of the interest is that it relates to my performance and remuneration in the role of CEO and my contract of employment with the city. Um, we also have disclosure of impartiality interest from Mayor Emma Cole in relation to item 5.4, Bullrav Perth. Uh, the extent of the Mayor's interest is that she has known the applicant as an acquaintance over a 14-year period and as a consequence there may be a perception that Mayor Cole's impartiality on the matter could be affected. Mayor Cole has declared that she will consider the matter on its merits and um, this evening. I was going to say and vote accordingly next week but the Mayor's not going to be here next week. Um, a further disclosure of impartiality from Councillor Jonathan Hallett in relation to briefing item 5.2, extension of hours for premises in Bulwer Street. The nature of the impartiality interest is that Councillor Hallett resides in a property that is diagonally behind the premises in question next door to where a noise sensitive receiver was located for the acoustic report. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Hallett's impartiality on the matter could be affected. Councillor Hallett has declared that he will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly at next week's meeting. And finally, an impartiality interest disclosure from Councillor Ros Harley in relation to item 5.4. Um, the nature of Councillor Harley's disclosure is that the applicant is known to her through a mutual friend and has been over a long period of time. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Harley's impartiality on the matter could be affected. Councillor Harley has declared that she will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly at next week's council meeting. Thank you, CEO. So just um, for um, members in the public gallery, the way that the council briefing works is that we, as a council, will now go through the items sequentially and it's an opportunity for council members to ask questions of administration and the decision-making meeting will occur next Tuesday night. So um, there won't be any debate tonight. Um, council members, we'll start with um, 5.1, number 73, 288, Lord Street, Highgate, change of use from shop to unlisted use cigar bar. Are there questions in relation to this item? Councillor Hallett. Thank you. Uh, through the Mayor to the Acting uh, Director of Development Services. Could you clarify the requirement for the applicant to have a separate licence issued by the Department of Health under the Tobacco Products Control Act and how this relates to the sale of tobacco products versus the smoking of tobacco products within the enclosed space? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the applicant is indeed required to have a separate licence in terms of the specifics as it, require, as it relates to consumption as opposed to sale. Uh, that can be clarified through the briefing notes. Could you also provide some additional information to clarify the legal advice that admin has received that the Tobacco Control Act wording that defines a public place as inclusive of a place being used by a section of the public by virtue of membership does not apply uh, to this particular premise? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that clarification can be provided. Are you also able to advise some more detail about the air filtration system proposed within the business and how the establishment will meet its obligations under occupational health and safety legislation to prevent exposure of secondhand smoke to their two employees? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. On that matter, the, the application involves the provision of uh, two air filtration systems, which uh, claims to uh, produce a result of 99.97% um, filtration. Uh, in addition to, or I suppose, as a result of that air filtration system, there will be some 
uh, emissions being a combination of clean air and tobacco smoke. And as such, there is also the need for mechanical uh, ventilation uh, through the, uh, the exhaust fan to the roof. Uh, but in terms of the occupational health and safety requirements, that can be clarified through the, uh, the briefing notes. Can I also just confirm about the, um, apart from the filtration that occurs within the premises, because I think I, I'm still curious as to how someone smoking and blowing out air, what happens between this, that point and it actually entering some kind of system for filtration, um, but also in terms of the air that's released from the roof of the apartment complex, um, the report mentions that it will contain some tobacco pollutants. Can you just confirm that? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, I can confirm that. Um, and lastly, um, I, c I couldn't see it clearly in the report, but what have been the considerations around the amenity impact of um, people on the apartment open balconies um, with this particular um, exhaust coming out of the roof of their building? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the applicable Australian standard uh, stipulates a minimum separation distance from a, a variety of uh, features, including balconies. Uh, so that would be, well, they would need a uh, certificate to ensure, to certify, I'm sorry, compliance with the Australian standard. Councillors, questions? Councillor Gonshevsky. Thank you, Mayor. Through you to the uh, Acting Director of Development Services. Just um, in relation to the comments from the, um, the gallery, uh, what's the, the current approval is for shop and um, or eating house? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the comments from the applicant are note regarding the eating house are noted. Uh, the records that have been viewed thus far would suggest that there is an approval for a shop. However, uh, Certainly, noting the uh, the applicant's comments, they can they can be clarified through the briefing notes. That'd be good. Um, and and just querying whether there's an existing approved car parking shortfall associated with the use, and whether cash and loo has previously been paid for any shortfall. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, that can be clarified uh, as part of the, uh, the previous approvals. And just to confirm, in relation to the uh, the plan of the fit-out, just um, where, where are the toilet facilities associated with this tenancy? Through you, Mayor Cole, the, the submitted plans uh, as contained in Attachment 2 don't actually uh, stipulate the toilets, but they can be clarified through the briefing notes. Um, and in terms of the noise report, I understand that it was uh, the re noise report that's been submitted um, was a pre-construction report, is that correct? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, judging by the date of the report, I'd suggest that is the case, yes. Um, it would appear from the report that it um, considers the varying land uses um, within the report. Um, and I, I would be grateful if in the briefing notes um, there could be um, some specific reference to the elements of the report that um, relate to the land use. Um, and would probably, and I think fair, should foreshadow an amendment next week in relation to an updated acoustic report to actually reflect the proposed land use. Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, we can provide clarification and we can also provide uh, alternate wording as well. Councillor Gonczewski, do you have further questions? Just one, in relation to um, how um, compliance with conditions are monitored in um, these sorts of situations where there isn't public access to a building, some advice on that would be um, appreciated. Through you, Mayor Cole, under the planning legislation, the city would have powers of entry uh, to check if any can to check any aspect of the approval has been complied with. Councillors, Councillor Harley. Um, thank you, Mayor, um, to the Director, um, through yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm just noting that this building, in one of the submissions, um, there are a number of other owners within that building. 
So I'm wanting to find out, um, Director, whether this is a strata complex and whether we've got any commentary or approvals from the strata complex. It's understand residential, commercial. I could be mistaken about that. But do we have any approvals from the strata complex in regards to this usage? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, it is a, a strata situation uh, of a mixed-use nature, so there are businesses and uh, residential apartments uh, combined. In terms of the consents, that has been provided by the applicant from the, strata, the body corporate. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Um, just to repeat, so there's been approval by the strata management to, for this usage? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that is correct. Um, one of the other comments here is that when it was previously operating um, as an eating house that the, um, the um, extraction fans um, released, um, um, released odours, etc., um, into the space which could be smelt by the residents. So I'm just wanting to double check and following on from Councillor Hallett's um, questions in regards to what is their approach to mitigate the cigar smoke. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, as mentioned previously, the Australian standard sets out the, the separation distances that are uh, required to be complied with. Uh, but following on from that, the uh, staff can seek clarification from the applicant and report that back to the briefing notes. Thank you, um, Director. I understand the Australian standards, but my question relates to the amenity of residents within that building. Um, so I guess as a group of people being asked to make this decision, I'm wanting to know, apart from the stock standard Australian standards, is there anything else that our council requires so that the amenity for residents within this building is at least some way uh, protected, given that one of the um, submitters said that they could smell food, um, food smells coming from that same location when it was an eating house? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, the City can seek clarification from the applicant and report that back to the briefing notes. Councillors? Um, just a couple of follow-up questions, um, Director. Um, I just wanted to ask whether the licence from, um, from the Department of Health has been issued, if we're aware from the applicant, if they have received the licence. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I'm unaware, but again, that can be uh, reported back to the briefing notes. Thank you. And just in relation to the community consultation, I note that of the 17 um, respondents, 13 were not in favour and raised issues of proximity to the residential dwellings and odour. Is it possible for Council to get some information about where those particular um, residents live within that, if they are within that building and if they're in close proximity to, um, to the to the proposed cigar bar and also to the um, ventilator. Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that can be provided. And just one more minor question on the um, visual, whether the windows will remain visually permeable? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, recommended condition to uh, has been suggested to ensure that is the case. Thank you, Director. Councillors, are there any further questions on this item? Okay, thank you. We'll move on to 5.2. Number 45 of 87 Bull Street, Perth, proposed amendment to operating hours to an existing development approval for an eating house. Are there questions in relation to this item? Councillor Godashevsky? Um, just uh, in relation to the... Um, Acoustic report, um, just whether it considered noise from the Alfresca area in assessing compliance of three to the, to the Director of Development Services. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, I'll seek clarification on that and report back to the briefing notes. Um, I, I note that um, in the report it states that um, after 10pm patrons should be inside and also recommends closing procedures to be undertaken, I think, in a manner that was considerate of noise. Um, the recommendations from the acoustic report aren't reflected in the um, current um, recommendation for approval and um, just advice on, uh, in relation to including that as a condition. 
Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that can be done, um, and I can prepare, prepare some wording accordingly. Councillors, any further questions on 5.2? Okay, we'll move on to 5.3 which is number one, Muriel Place Leaderville, proposed alterations and additions to a single house. Councillor Loden. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, through the Chair to Director of Development Services, um, one of the commentaries or issues raised from the community is around um, the uh, overseeing from the, that uh, development at the rear of the property there, and one of the proposals is to include um, trees uh, to, to reduce that impact. Um, do, is that conditioned as part of this approval because it's on the landscaping plan or do we need a separate um, approval? I think the plan's on a page 177 show two plum trees. Through you, Mayor Cole, that would generally be um, controlled under proposed condition 5.1 and 5.2 being the landscaping plans. I think it's important to note, however, that the landscaping in this for that aspect is not actually required to achieve compliance, as the application already does achieve compliance. It is, uh, in effect, an offering from the applicant to I suppose, alleviate some of the concerns for the neighbours, and from the administration point of view, uh, it would be satisfactory to resolve that via Condition 5. So follow up then, um, if, uh, if it's approved as it is, um, it would still need to plant those two trees because it's in the landscaping plan? Through you, Mayor Cole. Yes, that's correct. Councillors, any questions? Um, Director, I just wanted to ask if you could go through some of the concerns that were raised um, through the consultation process. Um, there was loss of privacy from the proposal by way of windows on the upper floor and um, in particular um, loss of access to sunlight to the adjoining properties as a result of the development. Could you just address those two points? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, both you know, the application complies with the Residential Design Codes uh, in relation to both visual privacy and solar access, um, and for that reason the issue wasn't fleshed out in the actual report, but uh, Further detail on that can be provided for the briefing notes to explain exactly how and why it complies. And could you also explain what the development potential of the site is at R60 in terms of stories? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that can be provided as well. I think it's three stories. I just realised it was really a Dorothy Dixer. Um, okay. Um, are there any further questions on this item? All right. Um, and just, I think that the report goes to it, but I think the streetscape is an important um, matter that talks about the intact streetscape on the, particularly on the um, south side of the street. If that's included in the report. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Yes, it is. Um, and administration have taken the view that in relation to the streetscape, the, the development is quite sympathetic insofar as it's located at the rear uh, of the existing dwelling and actively retains the dwelling. Thank you, Director. Are there any questions? No? Okay, thank you. Item 5.4, um, number three, Bull Avenue, Perth, proposed and existing alterations to a single house. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. A couple of questions. Firstly, uh, if it's possible, can we get a copy of the um, submission that was made during the consultation process in the briefing notes, please? Through you, Mayor yes, that can be provided. Thank you. Um, and just so that I understand, uh, the officer recommendation is to uh, effectively require the removal of the render to the front of the property, and yet we have a submission which says that the removal of the render because of the type of render that's been used will likely significantly damage the brick facade. Can we just get some clarity around whether that has been tested by, uh, or whether, if, actually I'll ask it another way, if we haven't yet received, can we get some third party advice on whether that is actually the case, please? I know that it's in the report that's been submitted, but perhaps if we could get somebody who's skilled in the area to provide the city with specific advice on the render, um, and perhaps with the owner's consent, even if a test, an unobtrusive test, uh, space could even be investigated so we can get some information to confirm or 
whether that is actually the case? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, the City has already obtained the advice, but that can be provided again through the briefing notes. Councillor Hallett. Thanks. Can I just clarify what um, financial support is available to people who have um, buildings that are heritage listed and in terms of the comment from the Public Gallery about, I guess, not being eligible for um, that support? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, through the briefing notes, we can provide advice as to what financial uh, assistance is available and also information as to the application that was previously made by the current landowner. Councillor Tuppelberg. Um, I'll speak more to it next week, and it do, but it, it does directly relate to this, I suppose. Is, but can we just confirm that when uh, when there is a change in the um, when a property is sold, so there's a change in the uh, person whose name is on the rates notice? My understanding is the city sends a welcome pack to uh, members of the community. Can we clarify whether properties that sit on our MHI or on the state register, whether we include any heritage information within that welcome pack? At that time, please. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, we can provide some advice on that. Councillor Loden and then Councillor Konaszewski. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and to follow on from the questions from the, the gallery around the window, I think I've got this correct, the window frames in bedroom one and three um, were already, uh, it's suggested they were already installed prior to ownership and that therefore the condition is inappropriate around the, the window frame. So could you provide a response to that? Does that make sense? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes it does. Um, the comments from the applicant's representative regarding the windows are noted uh, and staff will investigate that and clarify uh, the exact nature of the application and what, what approvals are being sought. Uh, in terms of when the works were done, uh, we'd also need to see clarification from the applicant as to whether they existed when they purchased the property, but that can all be provided for the briefing notes. So if uh, work was undertaken prior to the purchase, then uh, that would then mean those, those conditions, wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to impose those conditions? No. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, if works were undertaken previously without approval, a change of ownership does not, in effect, authorise those works. Uh, so the council would still need to consider the appropriateness of those works. Councillors, Councillor Gonczewski. Um, just one. Um, in, in, if the um, if the render's been applied... Um, uh, uh, in terms of the submission to address water damage, just um, some advice on what other options would be available to mitigate or address the damage would be appreciated. And, and I, I guess an assessment of cost implication um, would also be appreciated if that's able to be provided. Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that can be provided. Councillor Harley. Um, Mayor, um, to the director, the home is listed as being on the MHI category A. Is the owner of the property allowed to have their property taken off the register? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, there are ways for uh, places to be removed from the municipal, inv municipal inventory as well as the heritage list. So, yes, that can be done. Can I just clarify that, Director, it's also in this, it's on the heritage list attached to the planning scheme as well? Does that make it a higher bar? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that's an additional uh, statutory framework that applies uh, in addition to the municipal inventory. Uh, there is also a process to go that can be pursued to remove it off that list. Councillor Harley, any further questions? Um, councillors, okay, I just wanted to make sure we just need to absolutely ascertain the issue about the metal frames because the applicant is of the view they're all wooden frames, so I think we just need to be absolutely clear about that. Um, and I think you've already been asked a question where the element report talks about irreversible repair and that to remove the render would cause damage. Um, if the render was to be removed, would a heritage grant be available to do that? It's an, probably a new question. Um, and when considering the appropriateness of the heritage guidelines 
and the deemed to comply standards. I just wanted to get a better understanding of what um, what the sort of existing condition of the home on purchase has in that regard and structural potential structural issues, um, whether the fact that the applicant has described the house as being partially rendered and fully painted um, has any bearing on what then next happens thereafter. Um, also, this is just a, an issue that I'm interested to know. With tuck pointing with heritage homes, is it both real and the sort of faux tuck pointing that can be applied, or is it just genuine brick with with more, um, you know, with proper lime mortar, or is um, faux tuck pointing acceptable under heritage standards? Just out of interest. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I guess we can clarify that. But uh, I suppose as a general principle, it is uh, we'd like the works to be undertaken in a manner that is sympathetic to the existing fabric of the building. Um, rather than being a, a straight repl replication, um, it would need to be quite sympathetic, but we can provide details on that aspect of the briefing notes. Thank you. And the other query is just about the streetscape um, and an analysis of the entire streetscape and how this house fits in, um, because I understand that two of the houses um, along from this house are rendered and then we have a row of houses that are either faux tuck pointed or um, face brick. So just getting an understanding of the entire streetscape and how, how this fits in. Through you, Mayor yes, that can be provided. I think that's it. Any further questions, council members, on this item? No? Okay, we'll move to the next item. It's 5.5, .5, Amendment to Trees of Significance Inventory, 209 Brisbane Street, Perth. Councillor Toppelberg. Uh, I know that, well, hopefully by next week it doesn't matter so much, but if we can just get either now or in the briefing notes an explanation of why it's taken from January till now uh, to move the application through the system, that would be appreciated. Councillor Hallett. Uh, you, through you to the Director. Um, when a tree is on the significant tree register, is there any restrictions to pruning that will result in the stated epicormic regrowth? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the, the inclusion of a tree on the register means no pruning or modification can be made to the tree without development approval. Does that... Sorry. Councillors, any further questions on this item? Okay, uh, item 5.6, Amendment 1 to Local Planning Policy 7.1.1, built form. Any questions? Councillor Loden? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, can I uh, request an amendment for um, under Environmentally Sustainable Design Part C1? 5.2 that refers to flat roof structures that are not visible from the street or adjacent property shall be white um, to be amended to say to specify maximum solar absorption instead um, to an rating that's effectively equivalent to white so that it's consistent with uh, C 1.5.3. Yeah. Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that can be prepared. And secondly, can I also ask for an amendment to C1.5.3 to change the maximum solar absorption rating from 0 0.6 to 0 0.5? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that can also be done. And then finally, just a question uh, which I sent through to the director last week um, around awnings. And just to clarify that under the current structure of this, if someone's to build a house, they would need to provide awnings to achieve the solar passive design um, requirements specified under the SD section? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, that can be clarified for the briefing notes, uh, but I did receive uh, Councillor Loden's email regarding eaves and awnings, um, and the 
R codes as they currently exist all already provide an ability to have uh, eaves encroaching into setback areas of up to 0.75 metres, but that can be further clarified through the briefing notes. And then, so, would they are allowed to do that, but can, would that be a requirement of a new development to have those awnings, or is that just they have the ability to do it to try and meet the requirements? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the latter. Uh, they are not obliged to do it, but they are, the R codes enable that encroachment. Councillors, any further questions on the built form policy? Councillor Gonshevsky. Sorry, I'm wading through. I just had one question in relation to the planting areas um, and the, um, the, the 3% planting area. Um, so if some, just to confirm, so if someone wants to provide 15% deep soil zone, the wording of the policy is not such that they would then be required to provide additional planting area as well? Is it? That's my question. Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that is the intent. But if they provide 15%, they are not also required to provide an additional 3%. Thank you. Councillors, um, CEO would just like to read out a declaration of interest. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I've just received a disclosure of um, proximity interest from Councillor Josh Toppelberg in relation to this particular item. Uh, Councillor Toppelberg has just drawn his attention to the fact that his family owns a property at 346 to 352 William Street within the area that's subject to the William Street guidelines. Um, as a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Toppelberg's impartiality on the matter is affected. Uh, Councillor Toppelberg has foreshadowed that at next week's council meeting, he will likely seek council's approval to participate in the, in the debate, but not in relation to the William Street guidelines. Thank you, CEO. Are there any final questions on the built form policy? Okay, we'll move to engineering. The first item is 6.1, the City of Vincent Greening Plan 2018 to 2023. Councillor Lowden. Um, on the community consultation, it says that there's 27 visitors, but only six people contributed. So I was just curious as to did the other 21 show up and then decide not to leave a message or? Uh, through you, Michael. Uh, that's correct. That's my understanding. They visited the site, but then didn't uh, do the questionnaire. Can I also just jump in and answer that as well, Councillor Loden, because it is something that I'm a little concerned about. I have asked our marketing and communications team to log how many people are visiting our Engagement HQ website, but not progressing through to survey. Um, as you're aware, um, it does require people to log on. Um, and to provide a, you know, some details, etc. So I have asked for that to be monitored to see whether there are you know, other ways of capturing um, repeat um, survey lovers who might wish to put in more than one um, survey response but still not provide a um, potential disincentive for people to, to take the next step because I've I think that when we look at the next item, you'll see a similar thing, and that's you know something that I am aware of and have been raising with our marketing and comms team. Um, an additional question: uh, it refers to some changes that have been made to Objective Four, but I couldn't, from the document, tell what were the changes were. And I was wondering if there's possibility of getting some kind of track changes on that. Yeah, through you, Mayor Cole. I've uh, noticed that on this report they're not identified, which is the norm, so I'll make sure that happens in the notes this week. Yep. The final one, potentially one for on notice. Uh, one of the um, contributors requested a tree um, for Brisbane Street opposite Lucky's, and I was wondering if that part of the, uh, the rollout of the greening plan. Through you, Mayor Cole, I'll take that question on notice. Councillors, okay, we'll move on to item 6.2, Draft Waste Strategy 2018 to 2023, Public Consultation Feedback. Councillor Loden. Just the same question again there around a the track changes version, is that if that's possible? Yeah, through you, Michael, I've, also, I've noticed the same thing, so I'll make sure that those track changes are shown in the notes this week.
Councillor Gondoszewski. Thank you. Through you to the director, just in relation to the consultation again, just um, uh, aside from the EHQ survey, um, were there any specific activities were undertaken to consult with the public or perhaps relevant stakeholders? Uh, through you, McCall, uh, not to my knowledge. And just, um, I know it's down for this year, but um, our um, engagement and consultation policy, um, where are we at with that being reviewed? Uh, through you, McCall, lucky I was paying attention. Um, I'm, I'm happy to um, advise that, that has, uh, we have made some good progress on that, um, taken a bit of a different tact. It was initially included in the corporate business plan simply as a policy review. Um, we have more broadly been working on an engagement um, framework of which will include um, a policy document but a number of other mechanisms as well. Um, I would anticipate uh, probably early in the calendar year we'll have that um, ready to come to a council workshop. It is a, a quite substantial um, document now so um, is progressing well um, which should I guess the point you're raising is that it should certainly inform our engagement practices for lots of these plans and strategies, and I'm confident that it will. Um, and just one more, back to the uh, uh, Director of Engineering. Um, given that um, the uh, city has a zero waste to land for by 2028 as a vision, I, I wondered whether perhaps we could consider an alternative cover to the waste strategy rather than a um, garbage truck. Um, I had perhaps prepared one earlier that I thought I'll might be, yes, that. and just whether that might be able to be facilitated yeah. for next week. <laughs> I'd just like to flag that as a potential uh, amendment. Through you, Michael, I think that's a fantastic idea and uh, we'll uh, sort that out. And I, I'm aware of the alternative um, cover, so we'll make sure we sort that out. With a, with a vision statement like that, you need an inspiring front cover on your waste strategy. Yep. Um, any further questions on the waste strategy? Okay, thank you. Moving on to 6.3. Trees located on private property. Consideration of introducing a limited local law to impose obligations on an owner to prune trees overhanging a neighbour's property. Any questions on this item? No, Councillor Toppelberg. Okay. 6.4. Uh, response to petition, Elmer Road and Claverton Streets, North Perth, traffic calming. Questions? Councillor Hallett. Sorry, this might take a while. Um, through you to the Director of Engineering. Um, feel free to take any of these on notice. Could you firstly just please clarify what is the process admin goes through when we receive uh, um, concerns from residents about traffic speeds and um, traffic management in the area? Yeah, through you, Michael. So typically, we um, we do what we did in in this case, which is to do some measurements, take some speed measurements, and uh, just to get an idea of what the current road environment is is working like. Thank you. And could you just detail what what does those measurements mean? You know, and how does that data influence decision making? Yeah, through you, Michael, as best I can. So we lay out classifiers, they're called, and they measure the volumes of traffic and the speed. They also measure the percentage of commercial trucks, and you can see that data in the report. Um, the, the key thing then is to uh, look at whether um, intervention is required. So, um, so in this case, there's um, a suggestion that the, the road environment is not working as it should in, in terms of there are, there's traffic speeding and the volumes are excessive. And we compare that then to what the speed environment is meant to be and what the road is classified in terms of volume of, of vehicles. Uh, and then typically we look about whether intervention is appropriate. Uh, we use that 85th percentile figure that's referred to in the report uh, of 50 kilometres per hour, and that's our intervention level. And that is the accepted standard um, used across the region um, for assessing the road and speed environment. And I'll preempt the next question, which is what the 85th percentile mean. That is the uh, maximum speed that 85% of the traffic is travelling at. So that means 15% are above that then? And do we know anything about how substantially above that 85? Uh, that, that's correct. It doesn't mean 15% is travelling above, but um, 
I suppose we look at real world conditions and people do you know travel above the speed limit so that does happen and if I compare that to the police intervention the police will only intervene where the 85th percentile is at 60 kilometers per hour um. And I'm just wondering about what influence a few other variables have on, I guess, how we use that 85 percentile um, number. Um, so do we ever look at the data in relation to things like um, specific time periods of school zones being 40 kilometres, driving the number more broadly down, um, whether the length of streets are taken into account in terms of people being able to speed up or um, in short streets they shouldn't be able to get to a particular speed, um, and also the impact of locations that are at slow points? Yeah, through you, Michael. Yeah, yes, we do. We look at the road, the specific road environment, the specific conditions, um, and uh, what's in in the area. If you compare, recently we did a report on Edinburgh, uh, Edinburgh Street, and there were some specific situations there, but it being close to a park where, you know, we made made some recommendations in in relation to that specific environment. Um, the report referred to a number of other streets being within very close to the 50k speed cutoff, um, such as 49.2 on Alfonso, 49.8 on Alma. Um, is it possible to get more detailed data on those sites rather than just that number? What, what does that look like in terms of the spread across the day? Uh, yeah, through you, Michael, we, we can definitely look at that data a little bit more closely. Um, you, admin has recommended two sites for traffic calming measures. Um, what considerations have been um, put into in terms of the impact on other streets um, in that area if only those sites were done? Um, through you, Michael, uh, nothing specific. Obviously, we've looked at the whole area and how it functions, and we believe that's an appropriate intervention, but we've not um, modelled anything specific that might occur in, in surrounding streets. Um, in the report, it talks about the 40k trial um, that's been proposed um, for another part of Vincent, um, and that if that, the outcome of that is positive, it might be extended to include the area. Can I just check what what's the timeline that that would actually take? Yeah, through my call. So uh, the consultation closed last week. We are preparing a, a report for uh, October Council with the results of that consultation. Uh, we, uh, if the trial was to go ahead, then that would uh, potentially happen this year, subject to everything occurring as it should. And the trial, I believe, I'm racking my memory, is meant to be two years, a two-year trial. So, that it, so in terms of uh, expanding it beyond the trial area, which is not included in this report, we'd be looking at uh, two to three years before we would be considering that. Can um, I just also answer that question, though, because I think that also is something that remains open to Council to consider, and I think a major factor will be when data and research starts coming in from Monash University, which has been tasked with monitoring the um, and researching the trial area for the Office of Road Safety, who will be doing the trial in partnership with. So that question has been raised with me by a community member, and I've said to them that um, you know, we would probably need to get to a point where we felt that the research and data was sufficient to demonstrate to the community the benefits and whether that's two years or whether that's at a point through that process. I think it really remains to be seen yet and that will really come through for that finer detail that we will be discussing with the Office of Road Safety when we actually go to start the road, say, the road, the speed zone trial and then to see um, at what points we'll start to get that data through in, in a way that would, you know, inform um, whether there are benefits of taking it more broadly. Um, and I guess just to follow up to that, I understand that there'd be a reluctance to put potentially a lot of permanent infrastructure if we move to 40Ks in the area in the future, but um, has there been any consideration around um, tactical urbanism initiatives that are, are more temporary, short-term things, um, such as what was presented to the last UMAG meeting? Yeah, through you, Michael. I, I'm aware of the term tactical urbanism, and we'll definitely look at it. There, there'll be a working group around the 40k zone, and they'll be looking at uh, those kind of options. Point of clarification for the lay people in the room. <laughs> Can we get an explanation of tactical urbanism, please? There'll be a conference coming out on it really soon. Uh, through you, Michael. I I don't know whether I can quickly Google it or whether I can make so but yeah, it's um, essentially installing uh, temporary and non-standard and unusual uh, changes to the road environment. You have, uh, Jimmy's artwork would be a good example. Uh, so non-traditional things that uh, would lead people to uh, change the way in which they use the road. So. And just, oh, sorry, you're sorry. still going. Yeah, keep going, asking great questions. Um, 
And just lastly, could you just talk a little bit about, I guess, the decision making around the report directly to, coming directly to council rather than doing more, I guess, consultation in the intermediate intermediate time, um, both with the petitioners and also um, the Urban Mobility Advisory Group to explore a broader range of options? Yeah, uh, through you, Nicole. Um, obviously, we received a petition and we made a, um, a commitment that we bring it back to this council. So the, um, the timetable didn't really allow in terms of gathering the data and getting the report together to go directly to UMAG. Uh, that's obviously been discussed that we can do that in the next week before council. Uh, we did um, inform the petitioners about the report and, and obviously the results of the report and we did meet uh, two of the petitioners today uh, and the offer is open uh, to meet other petitioners between now and council next week. Um, I guess I just want to flag but I suspect there's some other councillors that might um, have something to chime in about whether we can get a um, amendment drafted around opening up I guess a few more options. Um, for some infrastructure in that area, um, more aligned to perhaps some of the areas that were close to the 50 cutoff but um, weren't identified in the report initially, um, and embedding in that also some engagement with the, the community as well. Um, yep, so through you, Michael, uh, based on the discussions we've already had, obviously, um, we can prepare those um, options and some costs and um, bring them back um, before Council next week. Councillors? Hi, I'm here. Thanks. Um, can I just ask one question? In, in um, following up from Councillor Hallett's uh, query in relation to some additional data on some of those speeds, speed, um, streets that have a higher speed limit, is it possible to get the standard deviation as well as the um, uh, 85 percentile? It just would be good to... And, um, yeah, that'll do for now. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Doppelberg. Uh, thank you. Just uh, whilst we're talking numbers, just in, in relation to... So the I'm assuming the recommendation for the proposed treatment on Claverton Street relates to the 55 kilometres an hour, but if we look at traffic volume, uh, Alma Road, which is parallel to it, has 30% more uh, traffic volume. Can we just get a comment either now or in the notes as to why, uh, if it's purely based on speed, why we didn't see a, a similar recommendation for Alma Road? I'll ask that question first. Um, so through you, Michael, if you look uh, in the body of the report, it shows traffic volumes. Uh, and from memory, the access road uh, classification, which most of these roads are, uh, um, are designed to take up to 3,000 vehicles a day. So they're all within that limit. So both Alma and the other roads around it all function within that volume uh, as designed. So the recommendation, you're, you're correct in that assumption, is based on speed. So I guess if we can, uh, I, mean, we, I can see where some of the comments and questions are heading, but also in relation to uh, Kimberley's comments from the gallery in relation to the specific nature of uh, the traffic and the times and particularly its proximity to uh, to the primary local primary school. The other thing I'd be interested in is uh, some comments around the functionality of the intersection of Camellia and Claverton. Uh, so it's effectively uh, Camellia Street continues on but there is a slight dog leg uh, and having previously lived uh, locally to that intersection I know that it's it, it's one that's difficult to navigate and I'd be interested to know whether uh, potentially uh, flipping the stop sign uh, may be uh, maybe a, a, an easier way to both calm the traffic and provide uh, clarity through that intersection or some other signage that may help to, uh, to, to address that particular intersection. But if we could have a look at that, that would be appreciated. Yeah, through you, Michael. We'll, we'll do that before next week. Councillors? Councillor Loden? Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, for the slow point proposed for Claverton uh, Road, that's... Uh, cost of $7,000. I guess the alternative option would be a speed hump potentially. Now, this might be part of the broader um, conversation, but uh, could you provide a cost for what an equivalent speed hump would uh, be? And also the slow point includes uh, two trees being punched through the road. If we were to do that without having um, the slow point installed, what would it cost the city just to purely install those two trees in the road. Um, by putting this slow point in place, the street is rated for 3,000 vehicle movements a day. Does this now making it partly one way at the time change the maximum number of cars that can go down the road because they can no longer pass? And then the final one is the 
the second proposal for Lake Street proposes a swapping of the parking around for $6,000. Did the city consider the same treatment as Claverton for an additional $1,000 putting in a slow point as well? Through you, Nicole. Best I take those on notice. I think there's quite a lot of questions there. If you're happy with that, I'll put them up with the briefing notes. Councillors, um, Director, just to be a little bit more direct, I think the areas where there is interest in exploring treatment um, that hasn't been recommended by administration, if you could provide advice and perhaps um, a draft plan of what that would look like, was Alma Road, Alfonso and potentially Camellia. Yeah, three minute call there on my list and we'll do that before council next week. Thank you. Council members, any further questions? Councillor Castle. Through you, Mayor Cole, just one further question, as most of mine have already been asked. Um, in relation to commercial vehicles along Alma Road, I understand there has been some efforts by the city to, to address the amount of vehicles using that as a cut through to North Perth Plaza. Can we just include a little bit more detail in the report um, for next week about what has been done? And Because a, a number of the comments uh, from the Petitioners have said this is still quite a big issue and, and perhaps some suggestions for what else we might be able to do to uh, reduce that traffic. Uh, yeah, through me a call, that's possible. We'll do that before next week. Councillor Hallett. Sorry, and just one last one. I did ask this before the meeting, but perhaps maybe a little bit more detail in the briefing notes um, through the Mayor to the Director. Um, in terms of the recommendation around alternating the parking in Leak Street, um, just wondering about the data that we've got around um, to what extent is all of that parking used and therefore providing a traffic calming um, influence versus um, if people aren't actually parking in those spaces, it won't be doing um, what we're actually trying to achieve. Yes, we may call it. Well, I'll um, research and see what data we've got and, and then we're able to provide before next week. Thank you. Mm. Any final questions on this item? Okay, thanks. Moving on to corporate services, 7.1, transfer and dedication of lots as roads and realignment of local government boundary at the intersection of Charles Green and Walcott Streets in North Perth. Questions? Okay, 7.2, investment report as at the 31st of August 2018. Councillor Loden. Not the question you're thinking, possibly. Um, I noticed that we're underperforming on the interest compared between budget and uh, actuals. I just was hoping to get a comment on that. Through you, Mayor Cole, that does appear to be a timing difference. It's just um, maturation of, of uh, investments. Uh, so we do expect that that will pick up over the next month. Councillors? Uh, financial statements as at 31st of August 2018. We, yes, we just have a replacement page that says report to be issued prior to council meeting. Um, Director, if we could just ask, is that going to be Friday, do you think, at this stage? Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, I'm hoping that that will be by Monday next week. Unfortunately, the finance team are really consumed with the audit at the moment. Um, I'm not expecting there's going to be any problems but um, with the financial statements themselves, but it's just a timing issue, and so we will try and get them to council by Monday. Thank you, Director. Okay, so we'll go to uh, item 7.4, authorisation of expenditure for the period 25th of July to 21st of August 2018. That's okay. Well, Um, through you, Mayor Cole, thank you. Uh, Councillor Murphy has just provided an uh, indirect financial interest disclosure in relation to item 7.4, the authorisation of expenditure report. Uh, the nature of the interest uh, has been disclosed by Councillor Murphy as being Upbeat Events, which is the, um, the company that Councillor Murphy runs. 
has been contracted to deliver parts of the town team movement conference, which is identified as um, as being one of the areas to which expenditure has been directed. Um, as a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Murphy's interest on the matter could be affected. Councillor Murphy has declared uh, that um, at next week's council meeting he is uh, not intending to seek council approval to participate in the debate, remain in the chamber or vote on the matter when it's discussed. That being the case, Councillor Murphy, you probably do need to leave the chamber while I take questions on this item. Thank you. Okay, so 7.4 authorisation of expenditure for the period 25th of July to 21st of August 2018. Are there any questions, Councillor Harley? Um, thank you, Mayor. It's um, also just occurred to me in reading through this line by line, as I like to do, that, um, and I'm not sure why I've never asked the question before, but obviously all councillors um, um, on here have expenditure listed against their name. Um, just, I guess, um, some direction from the CEO, whether that's just generally accepted to be a conflict um, um, in common, so that we can get clarification on that and move on. Through you, Mayor Cole, I'd be happy to um, provide some more direct advice on that um, after this meeting, um, simply so I can refer to the relevant sections of the relevant Act and regulations. Um, the simple fact of the matter is that the, um, the expenditure that, or, or the the funds that council members receive is sanctioned under the Local Government Act and it's all strictly in line with a policy adopted by council and there is a particular section of the Local Government Act relating to when matters need not be disclosed and it specifically refers to um, council decisions surrounding uh, expenditure or investment in areas that are common to all council members uh, because all council members are affected and all council members are required to make those decisions. Um, as a consequence, the expenditure that's identified in this report um, is not, uh, as you would know, to be approved for that expenditure to occur. It's um, after the fact. It's simply council receiving financial statements uh, of expenditure that has occurred in line with both the Act, the regs and the uh, relevant council pol policy relating to um, yeah, fees and allowances for council members. Um, perfect. That's fine. I just thought it's worth putting that on the record. My question actually relates to um, a line item which was for not sure how, it's on page um, 12 or 14, and it is the item relating to Sodexo, Catering Services and ADOC Week Celebrations. It's I think I can answer it. five items down. Mm -hmm. so that would be Quidditch Catering, I would suspect. Thank you. Through you, Nicole, um, I can get some more detail on exactly what that is. Sorry, why a French multinational company was used to provide um, catering for um, all catering services to our NAIDOC Week celebrations. So my question on notice is whether there was not an Aboriginal catering company of which I'm aware there's only a few, um, so I understand if they weren't available, um, or whether there was not a local provider of those services. And I'm happy to put that on notice. Through you, Macol, we can respond to that. Thank you. Um, Councillor Harley, I'll stand to be corrected, but my understanding is that there's a relationship between Quidditch Catering and Sodexo, so um, I'm not quite sure how that works, and I think it's a good question, but I think that the catering was through Quidditch, but I understand your question. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Cole. I'm aware that there is that relationship. It, just, um, it looks on our books like we're employing a French multinational um, company rather than an actual Aboriginal catering company, so Very maybe in brackets or something like that, um, yeah. but perhaps for next week. Thank you. Good question. Any further questions on expenditure? Okay, we are moving to community engagement, item 8.1, new draft policy, number 3.10.3, .3, street activation. Questions? Oh, sorry, Councillor Castle. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, first question is just a, a point of clarification. The, the first attachment to the report Street Events Policy 2.2.7 is actually the existing policy? Th 
through you, Mayor Cole, the existing policy is actually titled Street Parties. Um, I'm unsure why that has got street events as the title of the policy. Um, having said that, looking at the remainder of the policy, it does appear to substantially be the old policy, so I will um, just need to clarify that it may indeed be, uh, hopefully not, but the wrong policy has been attached as policy number one or um, a policy that has had a name change made to it. Um, I'll, I'll make that change as a matter of priority, but certainly the existing policy is the street parties policy, not the street events policy. Um, and, and just a question in relation to um, the supporting resources. So we've had some discussion about this at workshops, and uh, my understanding is that there'll be a suite of documents that are available to the public that's intended to be the public-facing uh, documents to support uh, general members from for organising these events, rather than having to rely on the policy, are we allow are we able to see those um, those resources as part of this report? Are they ready to be included, or, or where are they at? Director, can you turn your mic on, please? Oh, apologies, I've just turned it off. Um, the, the guidelines and supporting documentation have been purposefully separated from uh, this new draft policy. Uh, they have substantially been um, completed, but uh, administration's intention is to take this policy out to public comment um, and then receive that policy back, at which time all of the supporting documentation will be fully complete. Um, it's still not intended to necessarily attach that documentation to this policy, but certainly more than happy to distribute all of those um, draft materials to council members for input prior to them being finalised and released. Can I just ask a follow-up question, Director? I'm just wondering whether to have the more um, user-friendly documents might actually encourage more engagement on this policy. I think that when you look at um, some of the issues with greening plan and waste strategy, would the administration be open to actually pro completing those documents, perhaps circulating them to council members and then releasing them along with this policy for advertising in an effort to attract more community engagement on the policy? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, we can look at um, two options. First of all, we can look at, at whether we can just tidy those documents up and finalise them in time to start the public comment. Um, or the other option is for us to um, upload them as part of um, the draft policy consultation um, and simply mark them as draft if they aren't um, completed documents yet. But I certainly agree with the sentiment to include that, um, I guess, more public facing document rather than solely the policy document might assist with uh, getting feedback. Councillor Gonczewski. Thank you. Just one from me. Um, the, and this may well be in the um, um, community sort of outward facing documents. Just through you to the director. In terms of time frames for approvals from um, the City of Vincent or WA Police for the um, local um, open streets, local open streets neighbourhood, um, is, is there a set time frame for that process to occur? Um, just thinking people planning Christmas parties, etc. Through you, Mayor Cole. Certainly with Category A, it is a very simple process because um, in almost all circumstances, and it expected that in all circumstances, the traffic control diagrams prepared by the city can simply be used. So by using those templates, uh, the, the sign-off process for administration will literally be um, a matter of days. Um, the order of road closure from WA Police is, is normally a, a fairly short time frame as well. Uh, the only uh, extended time frame may indeed be for the, the secondary category, the neighbourhood open streets, uh, and only where a traffic management plan is required to be prepared, um, and that then needs to be submitted in, in, and reviewed by um, our engineering department. So um, certainly happy to have a closer look at those time frames. I think it is 
will be really useful information, even to include just as a guide within the neighbourhood kits if it hasn't been already. Um, but notionally, I would expect that those um, those level A local um, applications would be processed within a week. Um, the neighbourhood um, level may take between two and four weeks depending on the, the complexity of the road closure but certainly a, a valid question and something that we'll look to include in those um, supporting information. Councillors, any more questions on this exciting policy development? Okay, thank you. Next item is 8.2, adoption of policy number 4.1.30, recognition of Noongar Budja culture and history through welcome to country and acknowledgement of country. Questions? No, okay, thank you. 8.3, minor amendment policy number 3.10.11, community funding. Any questions? Quite straightforward. Um, 8.4, 2018-19 Community Sporting and Recreation Facilities Fund, as we know CSRFF, small grants application for Leaderville Oval Master Plan. Any questions? Councillor Toppelberg. Uh, thank you. Just in relation to the um, proposed master plan itself, and I know it's a little while away and the, the scoping has been, hasn't been specific uh, to date, but just uh, uh, you don't even have to answer it now, perhaps just some comments in the uh, briefing notes just about the intended scope, the uh, the organisations that will be involved, and perhaps the uh, the funding that the city will be seeking uh, beyond. I guess what I'm trying to clarify from the outset is to make sure that it's not something the city is doing on behalf of clubs or otherwise, but uh, recognition of it being a state asset, uh, currently a uh, football. When I say asset, I'm not talking financially. I'm talking. Um, in, in terms of its context, but also uh, the um, the role of the waffle uh, and, and the clubs that are there, and just to get an understanding of their involvement and financial contribution to the process, coupled with uh, how much say we actually get in what we want the facility to be and whether we are beholden to uh, the football clubs uh, and their long term tenure at the at the premises. Through you, Mayor Cole, I'm happy to include all of that information in the briefing notes. The project has indeed been um, fully scoped. Um, contributions from the Football Commission in particular have already been confirmed for the master plan preparation itself, and there are some um, conditions, for want of a better word, associated with that. So can certainly provide all that information in the briefing notes. Councillors. Um, Director, I'm not sure if I missed it in the report, but I've done the sums that we're getting $25,000 hopefully from CSRFF, the purpose of this report, $25,000 from the WA Football Commission, so $50,000 in contribution. We're saying it's a $90,000 project and we have $30,000 on budget. So are we, is there another source for the $10,000 shortfall? <laughs> Through you, Mayor Cole, there, there is two options for us. So um, we're currently reviewing the scope to see uh, ultimately that $90,000 budget estimate was based on um, some initial discussions with consultants. So we have two options. Um, first of all, we're reviewing the scope to see whether we can bring the cost down. Secondary to that, um, we have a, a cap of $25,000 that we can seek through CSRFF for strategic planning projects, that's the capped amount. Uh, the other option, um, if we don't think the budget will be suffi sufficient, is to um, go back to the Football Commission and, and seek an increased contribution from them. Is that likely that WA Football Commission would consider additional $10,000 or do you think it would be more likely that the city would need to reallocate it mid-year review or something like that? Through you, Mayor Cole, I think the, the more likely and, and probably preferable situation is for us to be satisfied that we can get the outcomes within a reduced budget or to um, find sufficient funds within the community engagement budget in the lead up to budget review. Obviously, the more funding we seek from partners at this point in time may come with increased conditions or increased expectations and as Councillor Topperberg alluded to, a leadable oval is the city's asset and we should be driving the master plan. Thank you, Director. Any further questions? Okay. 
Next item is 8.5, Review of Western Central Local Emergency Management Arrangements. Any questions? No? Um, so that takes us to the Chief Executive Officer item. I'm sure between Executive we can manage with any questions on this item in the meantime. Um, so there's one item, 9.1 .1 Information Bulletin. Councillor Lowden. Just a question on the development statistics provided. Uh, it now shows um, the value of DAs, so that we've uh, determined 24 million worth of DAs. In I believe it means 24 million have been determined in the last month, but we've got 69 million to go outstanding. Is that correct? Through you, Mick Hole, yes, that is correct. Any further questions, Councillor Hallett? Um, just wondering if there might be minutes from the Urban Mobility Advisory Group missing from the agenda? Through you, Michael, I'll check that. Any further questions on the information bulletin? No? Okay. Okay, so that concludes the items that we have been dealing with in open session um, for the meeting. That just leaves one final item for the council briefing agenda, which is 12.1 uh, Chief Executive Officer's Annual Performance Review of 2017-18. So we will just have to go into confidential um, to deal with this item.